Let me begin by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present and any members of the Indigenous community we have here joining us today. Um, it's my absolute pleasure, pleasure to introduce Drew Liu, who's a PhD student from my lab, to give her completion seminar today. Um, Joy's been uh, uh, an absolutely integral member of the lab, and I think um, what you're going to see today is a, a great project that challenges a lot of the dogma on multiple myeloma and black cancer, certainly microenvironments as well. Um, I think the great thing for me, having Joy as a, a PhD student, the work that you're going to see today is is because there's been so many things that haven't really worked out like they would have from the literature and so many interesting results is that Joy has come up with a number of really interesting theories about challenging this dogma. And they're not things that have been force fed to her about a project that was meant to work out a certain way. She's ad adapted to all the things that have come with her. And, and it's a project that I'm, a, I'm immensely proud of, of the results that she's generated. So Joy, I'm gonna hand over today uh, to you and um, good luck and I'm really looking forward to your seminars as I always am. Uh, thank you. Um, so thanks everyone for tuning in to uh, what I hope is a full length viewing of my seminar, not just a preview. Um, can everyone see the screen? Yeah. Looks great, Joy. Okay, great. Okay, so as most of you are probably aware, uh, multiple myeloma is the malignancy of plasma cells in the bone marrow. Um, so in healthy individuals, plasma cells are terminally differentiated B cells, and they produce large amounts of antibody to fight infection. However, in multiple myeloma, these plasma cells will proliferate in an uncontrolled manner and accumulate in the bone marrow to cause disease. Multiple myeloma is a relatively common blood cancer. It's the second most common, and it has a long latency period um, that then leads to an older median age of diagnosis. So active disease is defined by the evidence of organ and tissue damage. So most commonly, these are um, anemia, renal failure, immune suppression, hypercalcemia, and bone disease. And this last symptom is quite unique to multiple myeloma. Um, it's caused by the remodeling and loss of bone, and it affects an overwhelming majority of patients. And it causes really significant pain and an increased risk of death. Um, importantly, multiple myeloma currently has no cure. So a really interesting aspect of multiple myeloma is that almost all cases of multiple myeloma are preceded by these asymptomatic stages. So monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, or MGUS, um, and smoldering multiple myeloma, where we see abnormal proteins elevated in the serum and sometimes the beginning of development of clonal plasma cells in the marrow, but we don't see any um, active tissue or organ damage. What's interesting is that um, the rate of progression from MGUS to active multiple myeloma is only about 1% per year, um, and only 20% of those people who have MGUS will go on to develop multiple myeloma or a related disease over a 25-year period. So what causes some um, people to develop active disease, whereas others remain at MGUS for the entirety of their lives, is a really interesting um, feature and unanswered question in the myeloma field. I also just want to point out that um, most current guidelines recommend that treatment commence only when there's the development or the um, diagnosis of organ and tissue damage. So you can see from um, this slide here that the um, mainstay treatment for multiple myeloma is usually combination drug therapy. Um, so this normally involves a steroid such as dexamethasone, um, one of several different proteasome inhibitors and immunomodulatory drugs. Additionally, if the patients are considered young and fit enough, um, stem cell transplant is also recommended. And you can see um, from the range of um, different uh, treatments available that as our understanding of the biology of multiple myeloma cells has increased, um, the range of therapies we have available has also increased and their specificity has improved. Unfortunately, myeloma remains incurable because these treatments um, inevitably fail. So what happens is that patients develop um, increasingly chemo-resistant disease, and they go through these cycles of um, remission and relapse, and these cycles shorten until eventually they develop relapsed refractory disease. And so from this slide, you can see that there's clearly an urgent need to understand the mechanisms that underlie relapse. So at the very best, we can prevent these, or at the very least, we can try and increase the remission times. 
So one potential challenge in treating myeloma is the genetic heterogeneity of the disease. So active disease is the result of multiple genetic events, um, some which occur at the early asymptomatic stages and others which occur um, later on. So these early events are generally divided into um, two major subsets. So either the gain of whole chromosomes here, um, which is hyperdiploidy, or um, translocations that involve the IgH locus um, on chromosome 14 in humans. And then on top of that, you get a wide range of secondary events as the disease develops, including um, MYC translocations, mutation of oncogenes, such as KRAS and NRAS, and things like cyclone dysregulation. So when you think about all the potential sort of combinations of um, genetic events that can occur, you get quite substantial genetic heterogeneity between patients. Another really important feature of multiple myeloma is clonal heterogeneity or the existence of multiple subclones within a single patient. And this phenomena is not unique to multiple myeloma, but it is really important for understanding um, how relapse develops and also highlighting um, limitations of some conventional therapies. So we know that the development of subclones occurs early, um, as early as these asymptomatic stages such as MGUS, but what triggers these subclones to develop, we don't really know. And in this diagram, I've just um, highlighted them in this um, green box. So things maybe like time, genetic factors, environmental factors, or the bone marrow niche. So, and then as we progress into active multiple myeloma, these um, subclones will develop further mutations and they'll compete and undergo changes in clonal dominance. Um, and once again, we don't really know what particular intrinsic or extrinsic factors influence these change in tides. And then you can see throughout active disease, these clones continue to undergo changes. And particularly with the addition of therapy, um, is a really, therapy is a really potent selection pressure um, in changing yeah. the um, clonal tides. So you can see that while a therapy such as this blue one might successfully eradicate a subclone such as XY, um, other clones such as um, VW, for example, this orange one, might actually find the conditions favourable and emerge at relapse. Um, there's another phenomenon um, which is the incomplete clearance of clones after therapy, otherwise known as minimal residual disease. So in this case, you can see um, this clone here and this clone. And they are all potential um, avenues of relapse and a major cause of relapse. And what factors, either from the cells themselves or whether they're bone marrow derived, um, allow this minimal residual disease to persist is also a really um, big outstanding question in the multiple myeloma field. Okay, so it's well known that um, multiple myeloma cells are really dependent on the bone marrow for their survival. So if you displace a multiple myeloma cell from the bone marrow, it dies very quickly. Um, and no one has really been able to keep um, human multiple myeloma cells alive in culture for very long. So it's a challenge, but this intimate relationship has then naturally led um, people to ask are there particular areas in the bone marrow then that might support the development of myeloma um, tumour cells and might even allow them to survive and even actively evade therapy? So you can see from this diagram here that the bone marrow is a very dynamic space um, with particular functional areas or niches that are home to different cell types and therefore um, different physiological conditions. So it's been shown as well that particular niches are tied to particular functions. And one of the best studied examples of this is hematopoietic stem cells, or HSCs, where you can see um, in the highly oxygenated vascular niche, this allows them to um, activate and proliferate, whereas when you move towards the endosteal niche, um, this generally promotes the quiescence and senescence of HSCs. In the last 10 to 15 years as well, it's further been proposed and in some studies shown that um, blood malignancies actually hijack this HSC niche to promote their own survival and proliferation agendas. Additionally, when we think about the bone marrow and niches, also of relevance in multiple myeloma is this um, plasma cell niche, which is thought to be a collection of cells in the bone marrow, which provide um, the necessary survival factors um, to keep long-lived plasma cells um, alive in healthy individuals. So given that multiple myeloma is a blood cancer of plasma cells, um, there's an interesting question that arises, 
do myeloma cells perhaps repurpose some of these niches, um, aspects of these niches, or do they form their own specific niche in the bone marrow to enable their proliferation and survival? So as I've mentioned, uh, multiple myeloma cells are really difficult to keep alive outside the bone marrow. So most of what we know about the disease progression is derived from in vitro and ex vivo studies. But it is thought that um, some kind of genetic change in the plasma cell will facilitate localization of stromal cells in the bone marrow. And then this eventually leads to an increase in um, cytokines such as IL-6, BAF and April um, that drive the proliferation and survival of myeloma cells in the bone marrow. It's also known that myeloma cells actively remodel their surrounding bone marrow as disease progresses. And one of the best studied cases of this is um, the dysregulation of the cell types that regulate bone formation, so osteoblasts and osteoclasts, and the resultant um, myeloma bone disease that we see in most patients. So very briefly, um, myeloma cells release rank ligand, which is able to um, stimulate osteoclast activation and proliferation and causes the production of more IL-6, which is a myeloma survival cytokine. At the same time, these myeloma cells um, inhibit osteoblasts by releasing inhibitory factors such as DIGCOF and IL-3. And so what you get is this net imbalance of um, osteoblast to osteoclast, and you get more bone resorption, and you get the lesions that you typically see um, in myeloma bone disease. More recent studies as well have also highlighted that um, Myeloma can induce general remodeling to alter things like stromal cells and recruit immunosuppressive immune cells um, to produce a tumor supportive environment that um, prolongs and enables their proliferation and survival. Okay. However, I think um, a key sort of gap in our knowledge is that our understanding of myeloma cells, of how myeloma cells behave in the bone marrow over both time and space. Um, remains poor. And so therefore there are these critical gaps in our knowledge that relate to these aspects, um, including how and when disease is initially um, established, what the bone marrow looks like at different stages of disease, um, how therapies affect myeloma cell behavior, and the cellular mechanisms behind bone marrow remodeling. And so to understand these processes, it would be really great if we could um, observe in vivo the spatial and temporal interactions between tumor cells um, and the bone marrow environment. So um, intravital imaging provides a really powerful means to begin answering some of these questions. And um, I'm sure everyone in WeHi knows that Edwin is um, behind developing some of these very novel intravital imaging techniques. Um, and using them, we can capture temporal and spatial aspects of um, multiple myeloma pathogenesis in the bone marrow. So using this technique, we can capture data from the entire calvarium, and that allows us to do a couple of things. Um, firstly, we can obtain data from large heterogeneous um, areas while maintaining single cell resolution. Um, we can capture the behavior of cells um, across time frames that range from seconds all the way to hours. And we can perform imaging of the same area over multiple days to watch disease progression over longer periods of time, which is really important for a slow um, indolent disease like multiple myeloma. So in my PhD, I used um, a lot of these microscopy techniques in tandem with the V Kappa Mick mouse model. So these mice were developed um, by Marta Chessy at the Mayo Clinic. Um, and these mice spontaneously activate transgenic human MYC in B cells that are undergoing differentiation to become plasma cells, and it leads to the accumulation of clonal plasma cells. What's really nice about this model is that the mice um, replicate several key aspects of human disease. So firstly, the oncogenic driver MYC um, is known to be a key secondary mutation in a lot of myeloma patients in the clinic. Um, secondly, the mice take 500 to 600 days to develop disease, which mirrors that long latency period of myeloma in humans. And additionally, as you can see in um, B here, they also um, have an asymptomatic stage that's um, marked by the gradual development of a monoclonal antibody, which is analogous to MGUS in humans. And finally, um, you can see that V-kappa MYC mice develop end-stage organ disease, such as um, the deposition of things in the kidney, um, as well as lytic bone disease. 
So my PhD focused on using intravital imaging and the BCAP and McMouse model to investigate um, the cellular interactions of myeloma cells in the bone marrow. Um, I had three overarching aims. The first was to investigate how disease is established and progresses in the bone marrow. The second was to identify potential intrinsic or extrinsic factors that facilitate myeloma survival. And the final was to look at bone marrow remodeling um, that's caused by myeloma cells. Um, and in today's talk, I'm mostly just going to focus on the um, results related to the first two aims. Okay, so the first part of my talk um, is how does multiple myeloma develop in the bone marrow environment? So even before I had actually um, contacted Edwin to do a PhD, he'd set up this really great um, V kappa mic confetti mouse in which a V kappa mic mouse is crossed to a mouse expressing um, an AID directed Cree and a Cree lox confetti construct. Basically, the rationale is that um, AID expression in the germinal centers would drive the random expression of um, fluorescently labeled plasma cells and memory B cells, and that this V kappa mic genetic background would ensure that at least a subset of these plasma cells um, would be malignant. And the ideal end goal that we hoped for was that we would be able to create um, traceable multiple myeloma clones that we could follow through disease um, progression. So in characterizing this mouse, I could see that um, the survival of the V kappa mic confetti mice in purple um, were reduced to their control litter mates, they're just AID Cree confetti, but have similar survival to the V kappa mic confetti, uh, sorry, the V kappa mic mice in red. Um, the mice also developed monoclonal antibodies. So panel A here is showing um, different serum proteins present in a bunch of mice that are all over 500 days old. Um, so you can see that the albumin, which is kind of like a control, stays largely consistent, while this gamma region, you can see um, this represents the uh, monoclonal antibodies. And you can see in wild type mice, it's kind of a schmear, whereas you get these clear bands in the v kappa mic confetti mice um, that represent um, clonal expansion of plasma cells. Additionally, when we look at this panel here, you can see that fax analysis um, shows a large CD138 popula oh, a CD8, sorry, a population of the bone marrow that's CD138 positive and large, which are key characteristics of plasma and multiple myeloma cells. And then you can see that they um, exist in, or there's confetti positive um, CD138 large cells, and that they're enriched um, in this CD138 compared to the lymphocyte population. Um, this graph essentially reiterates the facts plots, but it just shows that when you look at um, a bunch of these um, primary V. kappa mic confetti mice, that when you look at the lymphocyte population compared to um, the plasma cell population, that you get a decent enrichment um, in the confetti positive cells. So it was really promising what we were seeing so far, but we wanted to know what the actual bone marrow looked like. And what we saw was that at end stage disease, um, the myeloma cells grew in the bone marrow in these very dense clusters. But what was really striking was that cell growth was um, restricted to single cell, uh, single color clusters. So, you know, a yellow one here, a red one here, and a blue one here. And then when we looked closer at the area where the different clones bordered on each other using 3D renders, um, you can see that there's really clear demarcations and there's very little mixing um, between different confetti colored cells. Um, I think whenever we do these things, someone inevitably asks, oh, but does the calvarium truly replicate the long bones? Um, and there's various papers that show this, but we also decided it would be a good idea to image some whole long bone sections of um, end stage V kappa mic confetti mice. And as you can see in this video, which is slowly playing, as well as this um, composite image, you can see the same phenotype that you see in the calvarium. So you've got confetti positive cells um, growing in these dense foci, and they are also once again largely restricted to a single confetti color. Um, I eventually had enough mice come down sick. It did take a long time, but um, you can see that um, there's a similar confetti infiltration pattern in the calvarium for a lot of these mice. Um, and what's really nice is that the clonal behavior of these cells um, also mimics what we see in the clinic. Um, so we see significant interclonal uh, inter variation between mice. So, you know, the mice all have slightly different patterns. 
Um, and we can also see in a lot of these mice the development of intraclonal variation, where um, most of these mice have at least one or two clones. And you can see in some cases you've got like one very dominant clone outgrowing like in 49 and 179. Uh, I would say mostly because I'm paranoid, I just wanted to double check again whether the confetti cells we were observing in intravital imaging were actually likely to be myeloma cells. So for a bunch of these mice, um, I looked at the confetti positive cells and then I looked at what proportion of those were expressing CD98, which is a marker that we find consistently expressed on B kappa myeloma cells. And you can see what's really nice is that in all of these mice, um, a large or the majority of um, confetti positive cells express this CD98 and are probably or most likely plasma cell like. Um, so another question I was interested in was, was knowing whether this clonal composition that I saw in the calvarium was mirrored in long bones. So for some mice, um, after I had intravitally imaged the calvarium, I then took all of the long bones and faxed them separately um, to see what the proportions were like. And in mice that have um, heavily infiltrated calvaria, so like these two mice here, um, which is suggestive of heavy disease burden, you can see that the confetti composition is mostly consistent between the calvarium and the bones. So this one is mostly red and yellow, this one mostly yellow. And this suggests that um, at the presentation of um, symptomatic disease in mice with this heavy disease burden, the clonal composition across bones has largely converged to the same dominant clones. Um, interestingly, whenever these mice came up, there would usually be one bone that had a um, slightly different confetti composition. So um, in both of these mice here, the left hip looks a little bit different. And I think this raises two possibilities. Firstly, that the bone marrow has an element of influence in what clones become dominant, so there might be an extrinsic factor, or perhaps there's just an element of randomness as to which clones um, enter and see the bone marrow, leading to um, an occasional bone with a different composition. Interestingly, in mice that have end-stage disease, but when we look at the calvarium, they're less infiltrated, so there's still free marrow space um, visible. The variability between the long bones is actually also higher as well. And it suggests that perhaps in such cases where um, the disease burden isn't as high, that there's still competition between clones and the competition is in a more dynamic state. Okay. So having identified this really dense clustered phenotype, I was curious to know um, how and when it might be formed during disease progression. And so for the next set of experiments um, that I'll show you that look at myeloma cell growth and movement in the bone marrow, um, I use this transplantable clone called VK14451, derived from the V kappa mic mouse, has been tagged with GFP. So this clone represents um, an aggressive um, proteasome um, inhibitor resistant disease. And I chose to work with it largely because, um, as you can see, the time to disease is a lot more reasonable when you're doing a PhD. Um, and the transplantable nature of, of the clone means that I could actually perform cohort experiments that had more replicable results. So you can see um, in the primary mice, the clone, as sorry, as seen in the primary mice, this clone also grows in these discrete clusters, um, both at early stage disease and also at middle to late stage disease um, before this complete infiltration of the bone marrow. So when comparing the dynamics of these multiple myeloma cells, um, I wanted to use, um, oh, I used these emu mic GFP cells, which essentially mimic aggressive B-cell lymphomas such as Burkitt lymphoma. And these were very kindly um, given to me by um, Catherine and Gemma. And the nice thing about these cells is that they also come from a B-cell lineage um, like plasma cells do, and they share the same oncogenic driver as the V-kappa mic um, multiple myeloma clones. So um, I've got the two movies here, and on the left you can see multiple myeloma um, cells, and they're relatively static, they're not really moving much. Um, and on the right we've got the B-cell lymphomas. It's a little bit more infiltrated than I would like, but you can possibly see here maybe up here as well, maybe here, you can see cells that are moving quite a distance um, in the marrow. Of course, it's very hard for me to show these and go, yes, this is definitely moving. So I actually quantify this data as well. Um, I tracked individual cells within um, the mice across the two groups um, and tracked the mean speed. 
And you can see that the mean speed of these um, VK14451 myelomas is much lower than the immumic B cell lymphomas. Um, additionally, I also had some um, cell movement data from my primary VCAPA mic confetti mice, and you can see that they also have a comparable lower mean speed. Um, and this is actually um, comparable to the transplantable multiple myeloma clone. And I think this is somewhat surprising given that, you know, these um, VK14451 mice are a much more aggressive myeloma clone. They typically cause disease, you know, five to six times faster than um, in these mice but yet they have the same slow movement, which perhaps suggests that um, that characteristic is inherent to myeloma cells and isn't altered by the aggressiveness of disease. So I've just um, summarized that graph to get mean speed per mouse. Um, and you can again see that their inumic and GFP B cell lymphomas um, have a much higher mean speed than the myeloma clones. Um, additionally, I've also plotted the movement of cells within the mice relative to their starting point to kind of measure how free cell movement is in the marrow. So each of these graphs represents uh, a mouse and each little line you see um, represents um, a single cell moving. And so you can see that, you know, both of these myeloma clones, the cells don't um, really move very much. Whereas in comparison, the B cell lymphomas are practically, you know, going wild and partying in the marrow um, compared to the myeloma. So you can see not only is multiple myeloma movement um, slow, but it's also appears to be restricted. Um, I also then performed multi-day imaging to track the growth across days. And you can see that um, the growth of these multiple myelomas um, are much slower than B cell lymphomas, where you know they'd completely infiltrated the bone marrow within five days. And I think another interesting thing to look at is that when you look at the growth pattern of myeloma over these five days, it sort of grows steadily outwards from the pre-existing foci um, as time progresses. I've also quantified this growth um, to show the fold increase of cancer cells between the first and third day of imaging, and you can see that myeloma growth is relatively modest compared to the B cell lymphoma. Um, this table just shows um, a summary of dynamics of different blood malignancies that I examined during my PhD. Um, I didn't show the TALL data here today in detail, but this comes from um, work that Edwin's previously done, and compared to these two B cell um, malignancies, the T cells were once again even sort of faster moving and freer moving in the bone marrow. The take home message of this table essentially though is that multiple myeloma has a unique growth phenotype in the bone marrow. So one last um, finding from this section of my talk is that we happen to have some young v kappa mic confetti mice. When I say young, they're 10 to 14 weeks old and that is young compared to the you know, 85 to 90 weeks that we normally see disease presentation. And what was surprising was that we could already see the beginning of single cell clusters, as you can see here. And in some cases, like this mouse, the clusters were already fairly well developed. Um, and it is a little bit unexpected because it suggests that that seeding and even the proliferation of myeloma clones is actually occurring at really early stages. So in the first part of this talk, um, I've shown you that multiple myeloma cells grow in clonal clusters that are discrete and highly infiltrated. Um, the clonal composition across long bones suggests that there's an element of randomness to seeding um, and that there's dynamic competition between clones during disease um, and that bone marrow seeding actually occurs very early in disease and even the proliferation is actually occurring quite early as well. And I've also shown that um, the growth and movement of multiple myeloma cells is highly restricted and slow compared to other blood malignancies. So this suggests that it's probably clone intrinsic factors, such as the slow and clustered growth and competition between clones that drives a multiple myeloma niche and pathogenesis. However, as I've marked in these little question marks in my diagram, what these precise factors might be that drive this phenotype um, remain a mystery. Um, so in the second part of my seminar today, I'm going to talk about um, the transcriptomic work that um, I did with a lot of help with um, SCORE and Edwin and Ramya and Joel um, to try and understand more about the clustered phenotype that I saw in part one. So 
We developed this pithily named technique in the Hawkins lab um, with the help of SCORE, where we combined imaging data with transcriptomic data um, from the same mouse. So initially we perform the standard intravital imaging to capture cellular behaviors such as location and movement. And then we're able to pull out this exact same area that we've just imaged um, using landmarks that are visible in both imaging and also um, in, on the skull in dissection to isolate the cells that we've just imaged um, to take for single cell RNA sequencing. And we imagine that these combined data sets would be useful for deducing what transcriptional changes um, underpin cellular, beha cellular behaviours, so such as clone response to therapy, um, clonal changes over disease progression, or in my case, what's driving that clustered um, phenotype that we see at end stage disease. So for my multiple myeloma samples, I sorted from um, VK MIC confetti mice that had end stage disease, sorted from the calvarium, um, confetti positive cells that had classic plasma cell characteristics, so CD138 and large in size. And then for my controls, um, I used age-matched AID Cree confetti mice. And similarly to humans, these mice, as they age, also accumulate um, normal plasma cells in their bone marrow. Um, just to make sure I had enough numbers, I collected healthy plasma cells from the long bones. And as a negative control, I also took follicular B cells from the lymph node. And so these were all um, single cell sorted, put in plates, and um, sent off for RNA extraction and sequencing. And so once I had the data from um, imaging, the fax analysis, and also the fax sort, and also RNA-seq, um, I just wanted to compare the confetti composition to ensure that all the cells that we were observing in imaging were then indeed being carried across to downstream analysis. And so what you can see is that the proportions that we see in imaging are largely maintained um, across the downstream um, analyses um, with maybe a few extra populations popping in. But overall, I was really happy with this result and the quality of the data. So the first question I wanted to answer was just how clonal um, the confetti populations we were seeing, sorry, just how clonal the clusters we're seeing in intravital imaging are. So um, take this mouse, for example, which we both imaged and sorted. So if we look at these RFP clones, I guess we have like three possible hypotheses. The first is that um, these RFP cells are all actually just one clone um, and they've spread across the marrow to where we see them in the different areas. The second is that the RFP cells are made up of hundreds of different clones and that you know, each of these clusters is independently made up of 20 to 30, maybe 40 different subclones. And then the final hypothesis, which is kind of what we kind of um, sort of um, think might be happening based on this clustering is that there's you know roughly five to six different subclones one large subclone here and then you know based on this one two three four maybe five smaller ones um, and we thought that based on the imaging but we didn't know for sure so um, unsurprisingly for multiple myeloma cells one of the most abundant classes of rna reads we obtained were immunoglobulin fragments um, and specifically igkv fragments and because we had performed single cell sequencing, I could actually take this um, immunoglobulin or sort of antibody expression as a proxy for clone identity and use it to further examine clonality. So for each um, mouse that I sorted, imaged and sorted, I was able to group the cells by their confetti status and then look at which immunoglobulin fragments they expressed most highly. So here I'm actually showing you the two replicate plates from that mouse um, that I just shown you, so this mouse. Um, so in these heat maps, each column represents a single cell with its, RF, uh, its confetti status up the top, and then each row represents um, an immunoglobulin fragment that was detected via sequencing. And what you can see here is that in both plates, most of the CFP cells are expressing high levels of this IgKV10 um, fragment, and then most of the RFP cells are expressing high levels of this IgKV4 fragment. Um, and in the case of the RFP positive cells, you can also see that there's three or four much smaller RFP clusters um, that are associated with other immunoglobulin reads, and I've sort of outlined those ones in pink. Um, we can also see the major subclone that's identified in the heat maps emerge when we cluster cells by similarity, as demonstrated on these Surat plots. 
And when we go back to the tile scan data, we can see that the immunoglobulin heat maps largely tie in with this third hypothesis I proposed in that the size and number of clones that we see um, from these heat maps and immunoglobulin fragments largely correlates to the number of clusters that we identify in the tile scan. So one big um, CFP, one big RFP and a few smaller RFP. What was really nice is that I saw the same phenomenon repeated with the other two myeloma samples, which um, kind of gave us more confirmation that the clusters that we identify in imaging are likely to be separate clones. So having um, identified that, I was also curious about what other factors aside from immunoglobulin expression might drive clonal identity in multiple myeloma. And so here we can see two plates from a myeloma sample that's clustered by similarity on the left. Um, and we can see that there's, you know, confetti specific clusters, and these again are correlated to specific immunoglobulins. Um, in contrast, when you try and cluster healthy plasma cells, um, you don't really see any particular groupings, which is what you expect because you really shouldn't have clonal populations in healthy mice. What was interesting is that when we took out the immunoglobulin genes and we repeated this similarity ana um, analysis, we pretty much lost the clustering. And you can see that the myeloma, you can see that the myeloma cells look a lot more like the healthy plasma cells, which are not really affected by the removal of immunoglobulins. Um, so what does this tell us? Um, it tells us that immunoglobulin genes, rather than any sort of clone-specific mutations that lead to you know, large transcriptional changes, drives clonal identity in the VKAPA MIC model. And it's probably just that um, MIC is a really powerful oncogenic driver um, and results in a relatively sort of homogenous um, population of tumor cells when you remove immunoglobulins. But it could also be that um, the changes between clones are actually quite subtle and we can't pick them up, pick them up with our analysis or that they're occurring at a different level, say at the DNA level. I think what's also nice is that um, these mice and their homogenous sort of um, population is probably also representative of a naive disease state where you haven't actually applied any particularly powerful um, driving force um, such as therapy. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens once we do do things like chemotherapy experiments um, to these mice. Okay. So then the other question that I wanted to um, get from my transcriptomic data was whether there was any kind of signature or you know, specific gene candidates that might be behind these dense clonal clusters. And so to do this, we compared healthy and malignant plasma cells as well as the follicular B cells. So this PCA plot here actually also includes autoimmune plasma cells and memory B cells that Joel collected for his PhD. But you can see that the initial clustering of samples occurs by cell type, which is very nice. Um, occasionally, you can see that all the plasma cell subsets cluster closer, and then again, the diseased variants cluster closer again. And so based on this data and the reassurance that our cells were behaving and looking like we expected them to behave, um, we performed some DEG analyses. So we compared healthy plasma cells and malignant plasma cells each to follicular B cells, and then we directly compared healthy plasma cells to multiple myeloma cells. And remarkably for each analysis, we only actually pulled out a small number of significantly differentiated genes. So these two comparisons where I'm looking at um, a different plasma cell subset compared to the follicular B cells were largely performed as positive controls with the expectation that um, genes associated with plasma cell um, and B cell identity would be pulled out. And that's what we saw. So upregulated, we tended to see things like um, XBP1, IgJ, B2M. And then the downregulated genes were largely things like B cell transcription factors and histocompatibility antigens. I also just did a very quick go term analysis of all the upregulated genes in the plasma cell subsets just to see what we were getting. And we pulled out very similar profiles with the top three terms um, identical. And this isn't really surprising when you think that both of these cells are pumping out large amounts of antibody. Okay, so then based on that data, we compared the healthy and malignant plasma cells directly to each other to see if we could pull out any kind of um, transcriptional candidates or signature. Um, and we pulled out 74 significantly differentially expressed, um, 37 up and 37 down. Um, and I've put this into a volcano plot to make it a little bit easy to look at. Um, and reassuringly for us, MIC, the oncogenic driver of VK-MIC, 
And cyclin D2, um, which is a cyclin protein known to be dysregulated in multiple myeloma and acting downstream of MYC, were both significantly upregulated. However, when we interrogated this list a little bit more, we didn't really see any instantly recognisable genes in this list that might be um, tied to the clustered phenotype. And if you can spot one, please let me know in, in the questions that there is one. But I, we didn't see one from our preliminary look. So then to get an idea of whether there might be any sort of more general common themes to the genes that were significantly differentially expressed, I performed a go term analysis on the 74 genes. Um, and I saw signatures that we might expect to be upregulated in the tumor cells, such as positive regulation of inflammatory response, um, cell proliferation, and response to oxidative stress. Um, and we also saw downregulation of signatures associated with um, the immune response, which maybe suggests the dysregulation or immunosuppressive response that has previously been associated with multiple myeloma. However, what I didn't see was any signatures that um, might be related to things like migration or movement or adhesion, which would provide sort of an easy, clear and obvious link to that dense clustered phenotype that I was seeing in imaging. Um, but, you know, obviously some interesting hits were pulled out from the upregulated gene list, suggesting that maybe there's a novel gene that might be associated or underlie um, the phenotype that I was seeing in the bone marrow. And some of these candidates include um, members of the Lice 6 family, which have roles in bone marrow localization of immune subsets, um, metallothionin 1 and 2, which bind various heavy metals and have roles in oxidative stress, um, cyclin D2, which I talked about previously, and my personal favourite, progranulin. So this is the granulin precursor, and it has a wide range of functions depending on how it's being cleaved. Um, but progranulin has actually previously been identified as an autocrine growth factor in human multiple myeloma. Um, I also checked for the expression of some of these candidates in human plasma cell, um, and progranulin continued to be my favourite because when I looked at its expression, it was almost exclusively highly expressed in um, later plasma cell subsets. So what's exciting is that um, I don't have time to show it here, but along with Izzy in my lab and also Steph, who was a postdoc in Steve Nutt's lab, we've actually developed a culture system where we can culture the VK14451 um, GFP myeloma clone. Um, we can culture it, we can expand it, we can actually infect it with um, RNA guides. And we've also shown them that we can take those cells that have been infected and inject them into recipient mice. And at the end, they still cause disease in vivo and they still maintain um, the, um, the guides. So they've incorporated the guides. And because we have access to um, CRISPR guides against all of these differentially expressed genes and the list of significantly um, upregulated genes is relatively small at 37 genes, um, a really exciting next step is to functionally test these candidates. Uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, did not get around to doing that in my PhD, but very exciting. So from the second part of my talk, um, I've validated the hide and seek technique, and I've confirmed that those large single color confetti subsets we see in imaging are indeed one clone. I've also shown that immunoglobulin immunoglobulin expression appears to be the main driver of clonality in this model. Um, and I've also shown that multiple myeloma cells overwhelmingly resemble um, their healthy counterparts and there's no like malignancy signature. I didn't actually show it here, but I have actually performed um, a gene set enrichment analysis on all of the genes that came out of the DEG, not just those that were significant. And I didn't, again, see any adhesion or migration signatures that were enriched, but there was multiple um, suggestions that the proliferation rate might be increased in the tumor cells compared to healthy plasma cells. Um, we did still find some interesting candidates, um, candidate genes, um, some of which fall into these question mark categories, and it might be possible that one of these genes might actually drive the phenotype or disease progression. Um, yeah, so basically summing up that multiple myeloma cells are a lot like their healthy counterparts rather than having a distinct sort of cancer profile. So um, today I've discussed some of the key findings from my PhD. Um, firstly, that multiple myeloma cells have a unique phenotype in the bone marrow, um, that they have slow growth that is restricted compared to other blood cancers. They grow in discrete and highly infiltrated foci that are clonal. 
Um, I've also shown that um, multiple myeloma clusters are established in the bone marrow very early on. They seem to proliferate quite early and that the clonal composition of myeloma cells across the bones can be dynamic. Um, and I've also shown that multiple myeloma cells largely retain their plasma cell identity. And while there's a few interesting genes that may have been identified as unique to myeloma cells, there isn't a particular sort of multiple myeloma cancer program. So this slide is my sort of personal out there summary of what I think is happening and sort of my philosophical ramblings. But I think um, in a lot of ways, plasma cells actually already possess a lot of what like desirable qualities of cancer cells. If we think about it, they're long lived because normally they have to provide um, long lived immunity for healthy humans. So they're not particularly apoptotic. They're sequestered in the bone marrow. And because they're usually pumping out so much antibody, they've adapted to coping with you know, large amounts of oxidative stress. So, you know, is it possible perhaps that the phenotype that we see with myeloma cells and disease progression is largely due to, you know, the large retention of plasma cell biology with a few small sort of changes to the way they proliferate? And I guess off that, you know, is it possible that active myeloma is the result of a critical accumulation of plasma cells and therefore security products that change the bone marrow and maybe we need to treat earlier? Um, is it possible that we might have more success treating multiple myeloma if we focus on perturbing basic plasma cell biology rather than focusing on multiple myeloma specific targets? You know, and is it possible that myeloma could be really hard to treat because they don't really move and they form these dense foci that just happen to be, you know, immune privileged because they're so tight, tightly packed? And I think, you know, obviously the answer is that it's not that simple and it requires a combination of um, different thoughts, but I guess a recurring theme of my PhD really was that um, in the case of multiple myeloma, we do really need to think about the cell of origin and what it once was, rather than just focusing on the mutations and the transformations that have caused it to become the cancerous cell that it is. Um, so obviously, like anyone's PhD, I'm sure this has kind of felt like tackling a hydra in that every question I looked at, two more would at least two more would pop up. Um, but I think some of the most exciting work in this project is yet to come, including obviously um, using this in vivo cultures, culture to in vivo system to test the RNA candidates that came out, but also based on what I've just said, maybe looking at, you know, a lot of key players in basic plasma cell biology to see if that also affects um, myeloma disease progression. I didn't talk about it in my talk today, but I've um, set up a reporter mouse that simultaneously um, reports for osteoblasts and osteoclasts. So it'll be really exciting to look at that in the context of myeloma bone disease and also um, bisphosphonates, which are used to treat that disease and how that all works. Um, I think it will be really exciting to look at clonal behavior in the bone marrow after therapy and also like keeping some of those mice that we've treated on the shelf and looking at relapse and seeing what the clones look like and how they behave. And also, I think, you know, we can't really do this in, well, we can't do this in humans. Um, so it'll be really interesting in the mouse model to look at earlier disease stages, um, you know, and look at um, stages analogous to MGUS and maybe even earlier to see how the cells are sort of seeding, behaving, um, and in interacting with um, the bone marrow. Um, so that is it. This is my final slide. Um, because it is my PhD completion seminar, I'm just very quickly going to thank um, my three supervisors, Edwin, Simon and Steve, my very, very supportive um, PhD committee that have been behind me 100% of the way throughout this whole PhD, um, the Hawkins Lab, they've been there for some crazy times, um, and everyone else listed on this slide, um, including my friends and family who have kept me sane throughout a very interesting PhD. Thanks, Joy. One comment I would make is that it's awesome when you give an introduction to someone's talk and you predict a few things. Uh, mine was saying how important and how I think your PhD has changed the dogma. And I think the talk that you've just given has beautifully summed that up, um, probably better than I do in my talk. So I'm going to be hassling you to to grab some slides. So thanks, Joy. It was a great talk. I'm um, just going to bring up the question. Do we have questions that are coming up. Oh, you don't have questions? I've solved my loma. Wow, you solved my loma. Um, 
Oh, we got a oh, Mark Dowling. I don't know if we're allowed to take externals, especially from people like Mark. Uh, for those who don't Mark, know, Mark, Mark's a clinician, um, PhD. He did his uh, PhD up in Queensland, but is well known to we high people. Mark, what's your question? I guess it's very clinically orientated. That's another good prediction of the future there, Edwin. So uh, <laughs> I guess I just want to explore a little bit more. Um, uh, that was a great talk, by the way. Um, the relationship between this model and the human disease of myeloma. So you've shown very nicely the sort of um, the transcriptional profiles found in this BK MIC um, mouse um, in relation to the normal plasma cells in that mouse. But I guess my, the broader context is: um, Are you aware of any uh, studies in humans looking at myeloma and transcriptional profiling of that, and how well that um, replicates the um, uh, the the human plasma cell situation. So, just so do you think the claim that do you think the claim that the you know the MIC the this model of myeloma is similar to the the normal um, yeah mouse uh, plasma cells? Do you think that holds up in the human? So I think um, like it's hard, it's obviously hard to ever like make a model that is as heterogeneous as like the humans, but um, there's that paper from I think 2012, 2013, where like they showed that the VCAPAMIC has is able to predict clinical efficacy of drugs. So that kind of gives you a hint that maybe they do have similar sort of workings. Um, and then, you know, um, Leaf and Marta have got multiple papers where they talk about how MIC translocations are quite common and that like that sort of represents the secondary state. Um, I haven't really looked at any papers, and I could probably do this myself, where I ha do directly compare human with the VK MIC, but I think for me that was sort of enough to suggest that it was a good starting point. Obviously, you're correct. Like it doesn't mimic non-MIC translocations and things like that, but, you know, I think in the multiple myeloma field, at least in the murine sort of world, that is one of the big models that we do use. But yeah, good point. Okay, I'm going to go, I think Sarah was next up. And I know Lynn's desperate to ask a question, then you can go after Sarah. Thanks. Thanks, Joe, for a beautiful talk. I wanted to take it to the other end of the spectrum and ask about the basic biology side sure. and your favorite target granulin. Yeah. I think that could be the key to really improving cell culture of the multiple myeloma cells and maybe some of the factors that you've identified could create a new secret source to growing them in culture. For sure. Like, that's like, your suggestion is so obvious and brilliant. Well, not obvious, but brilliant. But, you know, as soon as you said it, yeah, it makes sense. We should definitely have a look at progranulin. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Lynn? Yeah. I when I looked at your list of differentially expressed genes, I um, I was interested to see one that we worked on in our lab, ZBTB20, which was uh, when it was knocked out and Stefan Chevrier did the work. Um, the main phenotype of a knockout mouse was a failure for long-lived plasma cells to persist in the bone marrow after immunization. That's so I, yeah, okay. So, so I'm curious if you've, you know, thought about that or if the, the, the degree of change that you saw between your two populations indicate might be, it might be, you know, a, an important player. Yeah. Um, well, until five seconds ago, I didn't know that fact about ZBTB20, but it's really nice because it is in the um, upregulated in in, in tumor plasma cells. So yeah, maybe there's also some kind of like um, increased, yeah, proliferation, uh, increased survival mechanism going on there. Yeah, just FYI, it's a transcription closely related. Anyway, just food for thought. Sorry, a tra transcription factor related to which one? BCL6. Uh-huh, yeah. Thanks, Lynn. We don't know what it does, except we know what the consequence of losing it is. That's all. Okay. I'm yeah. Kurt. Thanks, Lynn. I think that might be a, a beautiful one, Joy, in the system that you've introduced where actually you can functionally visualize and test apoptosis, maintenance, recruitment, all these wonderful questions that your PhD have pulled up. Yeah. Right. Well, Joy, there's there's no more hands up. There's 
no more questions in the chat that I can see unless anybody wants to correct me. No. So I'm going to finish by thanking everyone for, for turning up to your seminar. And um, again, reiterate what I said before. Oh, is your KO system inducible? There's from Joe, that she just asked. Yeah, well, we, we can make it inducible, right? Yeah, I, I think inducible ones would be brilliant. And also um, something that's being driven by a lot of interactions and questions from by Stefan Vavut is we want to make a photo inducible Korean knockout system. And there's indeed photo inducible CRISPRs that have now been um, thought. And I think that that would be a beautiful one, Joy, to look at the different clones and how they interact yeah i think joe we initially were just so terrified with how delicate ballet designs are we just kept it very simple but yeah now there's the potential to like try and make them do more fancy tricks thanks it sounds cool so yeah just to finish up again i i think that joy your seminar has reiterated everything i said at the beginning um and although you said there's a lot more exciting things to come Without the foundation, the work you've done, that wouldn't happen. So everyone join me in thanking Joy for what I think was a spectacular seminar. And please, if you've got any questions that relate to the things that Joy have talked about today, feel free. Well, maybe don't feel free to follow up. Give Joy a little while to chill out, but please contact her. There's a, a lot more to be done um, and a lot more great biology. Thanks again, Joy. I think that was a, a spectacular seminar. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for coming.